friends, and welcome to the School Librarian Learning Network podcast. I'm Steve Tatro, also known as Dr. T Loves Books, and I love talking about all things related to school libraries. I may be an old dog, but I'm always trying to learn new tricks. In each episode of the SLLN podcast, I'll chat with a school librarian about a lesson they love. Hopefully, this can be a place for school librarians to get ideas and find new ways to engage with their students and staff. As a good friend likes to say, we're better together. So I hope this podcast will help school librarians connect with and learn from each other. The opinions and ideas shared in this podcast by myself and my guests are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. And because school librarians always strive to be good digital citizens, I cite sources when using material that is not my own. Without further ado, let's get to this week's episode. Hey everybody, I'm back and I am excited. I, I'm i getting to talk to uh, Kelly Hanks this week and I am just so excited because she's got so many awesome lessons on Knowledge Quest. So yes, we're gonna talk about one here, but you absolutely should check out her other lessons too because they are great. But this one really captured my mind. I'm really curious to kind of hear, uh, hear about it. So Kelly, if you wouldn't mind, take a second, tell us who you are, where you are, what do you do? Uh, well, thanks for having me. I currently work as the lower school librarian at a private school in the Metro Detroit area, so Michigan. And uh, I work with preschool through third graders, so mm. the littles. The yeah. very littles. Boy. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, how did you end up with the very littles? Were you planning to be a school librarian from the jump or...? So it's funny that you should ask that because I've been thinking about it. Anyway, um, I always love libraries. Uh, my mom will tell you that like if I was a grumpy teenager, she'd send me to the library and I'd come back, you know, a happy person. <laughs> but I never really thought of doing it as a job. Um, I always thought I would be an elementary school teacher, which I am, but, you know, and yeah. then, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I was in my undergrad for elementary education, and one of my classes was educational technology related. I can't remember the name of the class, but you get the idea. Yeah. And they had a guest lecturer who was a school librarian. Oh. And yeah, and um, she's talking to the class about what she does and all the things that she, you know, gets to do in her day. And, you know, of course she's tying that to technology and I'm sitting there going, this is my job. This is what I want to do. Yeah. And so I finished my, you know, education degree and I started teaching. I taught both for first and fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was getting my master's. And um, at the time my husband and I were living out of state away from Michigan and we wanted to move home. And so I started to apply for both you know, elementary teaching positions and school library positions, mm -hmm. figuring whoever <laughs> wants <laughs> to give me a job, I'll take it, right? And uh, I ended up in the school library and I have not looked back. Nice. <laughs> so I've been there now for 14 years. Wow. So, oh, yeah. That's awesome. Man, that's so great that they had a school librarian come and talk to your classes because I I was figuring out, I always spent 17 years in college and I never heard school librarians until I was in the school library program. So, you know, <laughs> it's crazy now that I think about how rare that probably was yeah. um, and how, you know, I guess lucky that I happened to be sitting in the class that day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so That's awesome though, man. Yeah. Love it. So how did this lesson come about? Um, so this lesson is about hexagonal thinking. Which I um, love, just even as a name. Like as soon as I saw the name, I was right? like, oh, I'm drawn into this. <laughs> yeah. And really what's great about it is you can use it at any level, mm. uh, even at um, like with adults. But um, it actually started with a teacher sending me a podcast over the summer. And I think it's important for me to mention that I have a kind of unique schedule for an elementary librarian. A lot of um, elementary schools are fixed. Mm -hmm. I am on a hybrid schedule. So projects like this are a little bit, I guess, easier for me to do collaboratively mm. because of the way our schedule is set up. That doesn't mean like if you have a fixed schedule, you can't do it. <laughs> you absolutely can. But if you're somebody who's an elementary librarian and you're listening, you might be going, how is she doing this? It's because of the way our schedule is set up, right? Okay, good to know. Um, yeah, so this is one of the third grade teachers that I work with all the time. 
And so she sent me a text message and she's like, you have to listen to this podcast. And of course, if someone sends you that, like, what do you do? You listen to it. Yeah. (laughs) And so, and she also sent me a blog post with it. And the podcast that she sent ended up being the Cult of Pedagogy, um, Hexagonal Thinking, a Colorful Tool for Discussion. Hmm. And um, this is Jennifer Gonzalez's um, podcast in she talks about a lot of different stuff. But um, in this one, she was interviewing um, a high school teacher who used hexagonal thinking in her classroom. And so I listened to it and how it was such a good tool for discussion and how it allowed kids to work together. And, you know, it was really student driven. And I'm going, this is amazing. But how could we use it with third grade? Because this was a high school teacher. Yeah. Right. And so um, that's when I then checked the blog post. (laughs) And the blog was from the Engage Your Minds blog by um, Terry, and I'm going to mess up her last name. I feel so bad. Eichholz, I believe it's pronounced. And um, she had talked about how she planned to use it in her classroom with elementary kids as a get to know you activity. Hmm. And at this point, the teacher and I are like, oh, We get it now. We could make this happen. So essentially, hexagonal thinking is like, basically, you take a hexagon and you write a topic, and then you can connect that to other hexagons in the classroom. So it might be that you ask a question and everyone answers it, but they might all answer differently. And then you connect, you try to connect the hexagons in ways that make sense. Um, we used it slightly differently because obviously with littles, you can't have a whole bunch of hexagons. You got to kind of limit that a little bit, but that's kind of how the lesson came to be. Okay. Yeah. I I love that your teachers are sending you stuff. Like usually it's the librarian sending stuff to the teachers. Yeah. And that happens more often, but an occasion, like in this particular teacher, like I said, we work together all the time. So if she gets an idea, she's like, I have an idea. And I'm nice. like, let's do it. <laughs> nice to have a collaboration buddy. Yes. <laughs> so, all right, we're going to do some hexagonal thinking. I am a student. I'm a third grade student, mm-hmm. I'm assuming. And I walk in, what am I going to see? And first of all, am I coming into the library? Are you coming to the classroom? So it depends on what part of the lesson we're in. This is okay. actually a four-part project. Okay. It's not just one lesson. Um, at least that's how we designed this one. Um, you could use it smaller, we have, um, but this particular project took four 30-minute lessons. Okay. Now, depending on the class, I imagine you might need five, depending on the kids <laughs> and what's happening in the world, <laughs> but um, it was designed as four. Okay. Um, so the first lesson, they usually come to the library. Okay. And this is a beginning of the year, back to school, get to know you kind of project. So the goal is to really learn about the kids um, and have them share some things with you uh, while we teach some of the information literacy things in a, I guess, sort of sneaky way. But yeah, kind of um, sneak them in. <laughs> yeah, sneak, sneak them in there. Um, so the first lesson has them writing six sentences about themselves. And these six sentences can be anything they want to share. Um, We typically say that it has to be school appropriate, Mm -hmm. obviously. Um, And we also avoid like broad themes. Like, I guess, or I guess we tell the kids to think broadly. So instead of just saying, I like soccer, I like football, I like baseball, I like tennis, I like, (laughs) like enlisting six different sports that they like to play. Mm -hmm. We tell them like, okay, maybe you say, I like soccer. And then what else do you like? Do you like to read? Do you like to draw? Do you like the color purple? Do you like, you know, summer the best or, you know, listening to music or whatever that might be. So, because it works better if they have multiple categories. I gotcha. Do you give them sort of like a list or do you give them some examples or do you sort of just see what they're doing and kind of nudge them if they need the nudge? Um, so I typically, the teacher and I usually share ours. Um, now there is some thing to remember about that is sometimes when you give an example to an elementary school kid, then they copy. Mm -hmm. Usually by third grade, you can say, this should be your answers, not mine. (laughs) Um, (laughs) 
usually by then they have a good um, idea of that, but um, something to remember, I guess. Um, yeah. And we usually suggest maybe some, like have the kids share some categories that they could write their sentences about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So sort of idea. brainstorm a little bit. Yeah. Um, like what would your friends want to know kind of question. Mm -hmm. um, and they write the six sentences and we use a graphic organizer so that they can track like, this is my sentence number one, this is two. You could just use paper too, but we found that the graphic organizer helps them. Yeah. I can um, see that, especially with the littles, maybe yes. that extra structure. Yeah. <laughs> especially at the start of the year. Yeah. And then what we have them do once they write their six sentences is circle the keyword in that sentence. Okay. So I typically start with, I used to dance ballet. That's my first sentence. And so the keyword for me is ballet. Mm -hmm. um, and then once they circled their keywords, they have to then think of a word or an image that they would want to find to go with that sentence. Okay. And we typically talk about how if you say, I like sports, and you circle sports, that might work. You could search for sports. Mm -hmm. But we also say you're going to get a lot of pictures for sports. And the kids yeah. usually understand that, right? Like they're, they're old enough to go, yeah, there's a lot of sports out there. And so we say, well, maybe if you say you like sports, but your favorite one is soccer, you're actually searching for soccer. Mm -hmm. And so they list that keyword in a box next to the sentence. Okay. Man, I almost want to, and I, I know we're talking about third graders and the first step of this project, but I almost want to do this with the seventh graders who are having trouble picking out, like, what is the key word in this phrase? Or what is our, you know, search term? What's our key phrases there? And that's kind of the goal is to talk about search terms, right? Because <sighs> as they go through in third grade, we, we start to infuse some of that, you know, searching skills. Obviously, it's heavily monitored, but yeah. <laughs> we start to introduce that in third grade. And so this kind of allows it to be something that's very, um, I guess, a good way to introduce it mm -hmm. um, without being too difficult or where you have to actually, you know, find information to go with it. I mean, we are finding information, but a soccer ball is not that difficult to find. <laughs> right, right. Well, and I love that it's authentic too. I mean, it, it is very much about them. And so, yes, we're learning the skill of picking mm -hmm. out a key word, but it's also relevant to them personally. So that's always a nice twist when you can get that in there. Right. So that's the first lesson. Okay. And that's where we leave it. They've written their sentences, they found their keywords, they've, they've created their search term. And then the second time I see them, this might be in the library, but it also might be in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of depends what's going on, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it depends on what the class had, like if they were transitioning from something, it depends what's going on in the library. So that, that lesson can be in either the classroom or the library. but. Um, we are one-to-one -one iPads, so okay. that's what we use um, in our school. Uh, and so the second lesson is about copyright-free images. Ah. Yes, or rights-cleared images, however you want to phrase it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so on my library Canvas page, I have an actual link to um, copyright-free or image, you know, rights-cleared images all the time. But the kids don't always think to go there when they mm -hmm. want to search for an image. They mm -hmm. just Google it. Right. And we talk a lot about how you can't do that, that it belongs to somebody and you can't just take what you want. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of the introduction into copyright in a way that these third graders can get, you know, because yeah. they get that a photographer takes the pictures and that the photographer makes money from the picture. And that if I take it, it's kind of like the minute they figure it out, they're like, oh, my God, it's stealing. I'm like, yep. <laughs> so we introduce this. And the idea here is then when they do any project in third grade that requires an image, they know they can go to the library canvas page and they can choose one of these sites and they can find an image that will work that's copyright free. Nice. So they use their search terms to find their images and mm -hmm. then save it to their device. Okay. Which is a step in itself for third grade. Oh, I'm sure. 
<laughs> I think that's a step in itself for just about every grade. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so that's that second lesson. Literally, okay. here's the websites. Here's why we have to use them. Here's let's search for them. And we have to spell. We have to spell them correctly mm -hmm. to find the image we want. <laughs> and then we're going to save it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then from there, after that, the third lesson is then taking those images and inserting them into their hexagon. So we're going back to the hexagonal thinking piece. So we give them a Google slide where yeah. the hexagon has been inserted into the background. Okay. So they can't actually delete it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the hexagon we have has been divided into six sections. So there's six sentences, one picture in each part of their hexagon. Okay. Um, so then they're taking the images that they collected and learning to insert them into a Google slide. Okay. Which is a great technical skill. Yes. And <laughs> they use Google slides all the time in third grade. Um, that's one of their go-to platforms. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a good way of introducing it with, again, not being something that, you know, has a lot of steps to it. Mm -hmm. um, they also have to learn how to resize the image. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Insert a text box, <laughs> type in the text box, change the font, <laughs> which are all things that you have to explicitly teach in third grade. Oh, yes. And in seventh grade well, and in eighth grade, I'll tell sure. you. <laughs> that's what I'm seeing. Right. But that's it's so funny because I just I was recently talking to somebody about how we think of kids as being these digital natives. And I, mm -hmm. I hate that term because they are not digital natives. They are human beings like the rest of us. And they've got to learn how to do all this stuff. We got to yep. teach them. I teach them. You got to touch that blue box in the corner yeah. and you got to drag it. <laughs> yep. Um, and, you know, we have to choose a font we can read. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. I'm not Comic Sans, guys. <laughs> Um, so they have to, you know, resize their images and put them into each part of the hexagon. Um, and that is all that lesson is. Okay. Um, and then the, and the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. There is one final step on that. They share it to me and their teacher. Okay. So through Google's a, lot of technical skills yes. that they've been getting there. Yes. Once they get the hang of it though, it's not too hard. It's just that initial, Wait, how do I how do I resize this? How do I do this? Yeah, you know, and it's also um, a game of listening, mm -hmm. and and being able to follow multi step directions, mm -hmm. which again in third grade is something we work on a lot. So um, we're hitting a lot of skills. Yeah. Um, so they share it back to us, and then the teacher and I can also see who's done, who's not, mm -hmm. um, so that we can catch up the ones that aren't, um, and we can print it. Our school doesn't have kids print from their iPads. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the teachers, either the teacher or I, will print the hexagons for the kids. Okay. And then um, they come printed to the next lesson. Nice. Uh, and then we talk a little bit about how you connect your hexagons. We give a couple examples of some possibilities. But we also don't give too many because the beauty of hexagonal thinking is that they're having the conversation and they're figuring out, okay, you have a cheetah on yours and I have a tiger on mine. They're both animals, but, so that connects. But if I talk to you and find out that the cheetah is, you know, you pick it and you really like it because it's fast, then maybe the fact that I like to run is actually a better connection. And so, we're going to connect the cheetah and the runner instead of the cheetah and the tiger. This is the portion that I just am so fascinated by the, the way. Well, I'm, I'm going to not talk through it because I want to hear how this goes. Cause this, in looking over the lesson, this was the part that I was like, Oh wow. And this is like the reason we did the lesson, right? So we yeah. have to make sure we're dedicating the time to this part. So it may seem like it wouldn't take very long to connect these things. And usually the first, round it doesn't it's when you ask the kids to like do it in another way mm -hmm. that they're like wait but this was the way that made sense and right. you're like mm -hmm. now try it again <laughs> um but basically they're making connections between their hexagons and all the sides have to make sense so if for example 
like two of them connect and it's hard to do this over audio. I wish I could yeah. like show you a picture, right? But um, if two connect and then another one fits in in one spot, but not the other, it doesn't work. It okay. all the sides actually have to make sense. So sometimes it does end up like a long skinny line of hexagons, right? But sometimes the kids can figure out how multiple sides can connect to two different people at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so interesting to hear like when they start to have trouble, like maybe they'll get three of them connected, but the fourth won't go in and they're like, okay, but wait. So they have to then go back to the drawing board and say, okay, well, maybe we need to switch two people around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we usually start with a group of four. I guess I didn't say that, but we usually start with a group of four. That seems to be a beautiful number. Okay. Um, not too many, but enough to force them to like, you know, have to make more challenging connections. Yeah. Um, when once their group of four has done it, we typically say do it again, but in a new way. And then we start to merge groups so mm -hmm. that they get bigger. So a group of six or a group of eight. Typically by the end, everyone's like, can we connect them all? I wouldn't recommend that because it typically ends up like a giant pig pile. <laughs> but, um, you know, typically what the teacher and I have found is that if we put them like on their back table and we say during free time, if you want to try to connect some of them and talk to a friend about where it goes, maybe that might work. Um, yeah. My favorite connection ever. Do you want to hear my favorite one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I think I put a picture of this one in the blog post. So um, there was one group that like couldn't figure out how to fit the like fourth person in. And one person had um, that their favorite food was like chicken and they liked cooking with their mom. And the other had YouTube. And they were like, okay, these two have to go together because there's no other way to connect these. And found someone, someone finally said, well, you can watch cooking videos on YouTube <laughs> and learn how to cook. Or you and your mom could start a cooking channel. And so all of a sudden we're like, all right, the teacher and I are like, it's beautiful. Yeah. We're, we, it works for us. So um, that's kind of the fun part is watching them figure it out. Yeah. And um, typically the last five minutes of that lesson is reserved for a little reflection. And we always ask the kids, okay, why do you think we did this? Because it is so many steps and it is a pretty big project. And they're all like, you know, and, you know, you get answers like, you know, you wanted to know who we were or we learned how to do this or, but you usually find one kid who's like, so we could all find things that we had in common. And at that moment, you're like, ding, 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 you win. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So it sort of like builds community while you're teaching all these other skills. And I love too, when we can get them to be creative within constrained choice. So like mm -hmm. they're locked into these choices, they've got their puzzle piece, and now you've got to really spin those wheels and figure out how do we make it fit together? Yeah. That, yeah. For me, that's a favorite. I love to do that, but I also love seeing the students do that because I feel like sometimes when the choice is unrestricted, they get they can either just spin out because they don't know, like there's too much to deal with, but then when it's too constrained, they get bored. So this is like the best of both worlds, I feel like. Yeah. And the thing is, is um, this sets the stage for them to be able to use hexagonal thinking in other subject areas, mm -hmm. because then you're not teaching necessarily the skill of using the hexagon. Mm -hmm. Then you can just make connections in the content area. Right. So you don't, not that you don't have to review it, of course, with third grade, with elementary, you always have to review it. <laughs> but uh, I feel like maybe middle school too. But, um, <laughs> um, but you aren't necessarily teaching that this is what this is. They've seen it before. Right. So now when I want to do it with math or reading or, you know, grammar or something, I, it's not a new concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you've, yeah. Laid the, you've laid the groundwork. They know the basics of how the lesson's going to go, even though they need the refresher. Right. You're not starting from scratch. You're not spending that four lessons again. 
Right, right, Ex absolutely. And you know, they've used you can use hexagonal thinking a lot faster by just having them write in the hexagon. You know, you don't have to insert the images and do all the typing every time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can have them, you know, uh, them printed and have them write in it. Um, so you can use it in multiple ways. So I'm curious, is there a way that you can modify this or differentiate for students that are maybe, if you've got a mixed ability level? So I think the beauty of this lesson is because it's about them, it's That's not true. too hard. Right, right. Now, I imagine as if you were to use this in the content area, you would have to do some modifications. Mm -hmm. I think because they have choice in it, um, that also lends itself to that differentiation piece because, you know, I'm going to choose what I can do. Yeah. Um, now, that's one of the things when we have them share it back to us, you can see who needs some extra follow-up. So that extra additional time, and that's where the teacher and I talk. Like, do you have time to help this, you know, one who didn't quite finish or do you want me to pull them or, you know, so that collaborative piece is there. Um, and all these lessons are co-taught, mm -hmm. so the teacher and I are both seeing, okay, I need to help this person more versus this person. And that's a, such a great formative assessment to get a sense of where mm -hmm. these kids are at and a bunch of different skills and a bunch of different ability levels. Like that's Well, like even just the writing tell. of the sentences at the beginning of the year is, is yeah. telling, oh, and it, it helps gauge, okay, where wh who's where. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Wow. Oh boy. This is fun. <laughs> this is a lot of cool stuff you can do. Right? Yeah. Um, so what advice would you have for someone who is going to try this for the first time? Is there anything they should kind of have in mind as they're going into it? Um, well, I think you have to consider your level. Mm -hmm. You know, that was us. You know, this was originally um, shared as a tool used in high school. And so we really had to step back and say, where are we? How are we going to make this work with this age group? Yeah. Um, we have chunked the lessons the way we have in 30 minute chunks on purpose um, because then it's not, you're not overwhelming. Mm. Um, some of it's because time, right? Like yeah. we have 30 minute windows, but in, on top of that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily want to teach, you know, the searching and the saving and the inserting and the resizing and the text box yeah. and the sharing all in one lesson. Yeah. It, it would just, just be watch their eyes fill up with. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would just yeah, it wouldn't work. So, um, you know, starting small and keeping it simple mm -hmm. um, can be helpful. I know that, you know, we use it for the images because we felt that was important because the teachers use a lot of projects that have images. And so they wanted to make sure kids were set up for that. But you could have them draw even, you know, like if your schedule or you weren't able to do this collaboratively, but you still wanted to include hexagonal thinking, you could have um, that element not be, you know, the tech piece. And mm -hmm. that would alleviate some of the, the challenge of managing it. Yeah. Well, and I think too, I love that you did break out the tech elements of it sort of in its own separate component. And I think that's an important thing to think about because like we already said, not all the kids, in fact, probably a lot of the kids aren't going to be showing up with the skills to just know how to do that. So like factoring that in as you're planning is probably a good idea. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 We, I just assume they don't know how to do it. Yeah. yeah. No, I think you have to. I yeah. think you have yeah. to. Yeah. So it sounds like the, I mean, your teacher collaborator clearly thinks this is a very worthwhile lesson. How long have you been doing this, by the way? I forgot to ask. So this is only the second year we had done it. Okay. Um, so we did it for the first time in fall of 2022. Yes, that's where we are. Fall of 2022. And then we did it for the second time this fall in 2023. I don't, I anticipate we would do it again. Um, we felt like it's teaches so many of those skills that we need to teach at the beginning of the year yeah. in a, in a uh, positive way that we would, I don't see us not doing it, but then again, we'll see. Yeah. But <laughs> the fact that you thought it was good enough to bring back a second time and that your teacher collaborator wanted to do this a second time clearly says, yeah. 
there's value here. Well, and, and she brought it to me, but really we did it with the entire third grade. So it wasn't just one classroom. It ended up being all, I teach four different third grade classes. So all four classrooms did it. So every third grader, you know, we could say had had this lesson. Okay. Did the other teachers have anything to say about how it went with their kids? Did they have like any feedback? Oh yeah. They, I mean, everybody sort of was like, this is awesome. And the conversations that they were having, um, the kids were having was, um, you know, so interesting to listen to. And you could easily see who kind of took charge and who kind of learned, was a good listener, mm. um, who was sort of your peacekeeper um, <laughs> or, you know, your compromiser, you know, you can kind of see some of those personalities coming through as they're having their conversations too, which is important as a teacher to recognize, you know, what, what's going to work in your classroom to play on yeah. those strengths. Absolutely. Oh boy, there's so many great things that are coming yeah. out of this lesson. <laughs> Love it. Oh man. All right. Well, this is an awesome lesson. I absolutely am planning to steal as much of this as I can and bring it to my middle schoolers. But we are now going to take a 90 degree turn and we're going to head into our book break. Book break. Squiggy. Fantastic. So, Yay. Yeah. So you can share any book you like. It can be personal, professional. It can be adults for kids for whatever. Any kind of book you think people should know about. What do you got? What do you want okay, to share? Okay, so I'm going to kind of cheat. Sure. Um, I have two. Okay. And really, it's like two-ish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Um, you don't have to be sorry. The last episode I, I recorded, the uh, my guest had, I think, 30 uh, books <laughs> that we went through. So two-ish two is fine. Okay. Well, we have two-ish. Because um, the first is a professional book. Okay. Um, that I think all librarians should read, even though it's not written for librarians. Um, it's actually written for um, entrepreneurs. Okay. But um, it's called, Are You Backable? And I want to not want to mess up here. The surprising truth behind what make people take a chance on you. Okay. And it's by Sunil Gupta. And it is seven steps um, that work, that are easy. Some of them are very simple. It's just how you even phrase things. Um, to make people hear what you have to say. Hmm. And um, it's so good for advocacy. Like I read it and I go, oh my goodness, I could use this piece when I advocate or this piece when I advocate. But like it, it's, it's beautiful. And some of it is just, um, you know, flipping how you say, would say something. Okay. Um, and I mean so- we need all the advocacy yes. we can get these days. So this is great. This is a great tip. Um, and there, it basically his, you know, whole point was like, how does some people, you know, gain the capital to start a business? You know, they're convincing and why? And so it's the same kind of concept when you think about libraries, right? Like how do some people push their program forward with how they present the library and others struggle in that area. And, and it's all in how you present it. But, you know, as librarians, we're not often taught how to do that. Right. And mo most people aren't. And so yeah. unless you're naturally good at it, which some people are, um, you, you might not know. And so this, this, he did a ton of research um, to figure out what makes people backable. Hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, every librarian needs to be backable. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, and then the other is a picture book author okay. named Sandra Fay, and she has written two picture books that are absolutely hysterical. Okay. Um, the first is um, The Very True Legend, Legend of the Mongolian Death Worms. <laughs> I have heard this title before, and I have not managed to get my hands on a copy, and I, okay. am, I need to get a copy of this, clearly. It's hysterical. So it's these death worms that live in... Mang Mangolia. And they, um, apparently it's a legend that they live, like, it's like a true legend there that they live under the ground, but they come out and they want to make friends and no one wants to be their friend because they're death worms. And it's, it's like a total story about acceptance in a very funny package. It's beautiful. Oh. Um, and then she's written a new one that's called the very, um, the, the three little Tara, tar, tarigrades, um, which is a science term that I was not familiar with. But these, I guess they live everywhere and they're like indestructible. They're like yeah. a real thing. Yeah. Well, 
it's in the story of like um, the three little pigs. <laughs> Right? It's I am so, so curious to hear how that comes together. I mean, right? I know so about good. tardigrades and I know about the three little pigs, but I'm not, <laughs> I've got to check this out. Tar tar tardigrades. I got it. Um, yeah, no, it's the three little pigs. So like when you're talking, you know, your fractured fairy tales, this one fits right in, but yeah. um, it throws in this whole idea of science concepts mixed in. in, in the mom like pushes them out of the water droplet and says, go out into the world and one ends up in like outer space and <laughs> so good. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, wow. All right. Well, I am definitely, now I have three more books to add to my TBR pile. <laughs> well, two are picture books. They'd be quick reads. So but nevertheless, they sound great. Yeah. Boy, I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing this lesson, for sharing these books. I mean, you are such a generous, kind person with all of your <laughs> ideas. Um, if people want to find you, where are they going to go looking for you online? Okay. So I do write for Knowledge Quest, although I've been a little bit lax on my job this year. We'll see if I can get back into the swing of things. <laughs> um, but there are old ones there if you want to read them. Um, and they're great. That I am on X, what used to be known as Twitter, mm -hmm. um, and that one is Kelly Hinks One. Okay. And then I'm on Blue Sky. Yay! But that one's just Kelly Hinks. <laughs> Excellent. And then Instagram, which I'm really bad at, but I'm there. Um, and that one's Kelly Dot Hinks. So I guess if you search my name in some form, you'll find me. Well, again, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. I love your lessons. Thank you so much for being here. You're so welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for checking out this episode of the SLLN podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes, which include not only a link to the lesson, but also links to the SLLN website, home to a curated list of free upcoming virtual events and resources for school librarians. It's easy to become a member of the network. Just visit the site and use what you like. If you have an idea, a question, or a lesson you want to share, you can email schoolliblearning at gmail.com. That's school, L-I-B, learning at gmail.com. Know someone with a great school library lesson? Let us know. Until next time, be safe, be good, and be well.